Well, good morning, everyone. And you're very welcome to our service today. A few announcements. In fact, quite a few announcements. So if you can listen to what is applicable to you. First of all, we talked last week about um, the Congregational Committee election. Um, and that will um, actually take place on... June the 5th when we will give you voting papers uh, but uh, before that we have to display the voters list um, and they're available in the vestibule. Just to remind you and this is from the code of the Presbyterian Church which sometimes sounds a wee bit peculiar but anyway I'll read what it says. Voting members in the church are communicants on the role of the congregation who are listed whether by name or number as having contributed to the stipend or weekly free will offering of the congregation in the last financial year and then there's as usual there's exceptions in addition to those listed the following also will be qualified if themselves communicants on the role a wife shall be qualified on a husband's contribution and vice versa where both are communicants this shall also apply should the contributor himself or herself not be a communicant, if neither husband nor wife, in such circumstances as a communicant, then their contribution shall qualify the eldest child residing in the family who is on the communicant's role. Should a contributor who is not a communicant be a member of a family residing together, then the, his contribution shall qualify the eldest member residing in the family who is on the communicant's role. And the last exemption, those who have been added to the communicant's role of the congregation since the close of the last financial year upon confirmation by the treasurer that they have contributed during the current year shall also be qualified voters. If you want me to explain that to you, you can talk to me afterwards and I shall endeavour. The rest of the uh, announcements. Um, Oh, just if anybody wants to complain about anybody who's on it, you have to put it in writing um, before next Sunday and give it to me or to Ian. Then um, the rest of the announcements. Wednesday evening, helpers uh, for the Bible Club uh, are having a meeting at 7.30 in the church hall. Then on Thursday, the Kirk session are at 7 p.m. and then the church committee at 8 p.m. Next Sunday is communion. And we trust that you will join us for that. Then on the 5th of June, the Young People's Day uh, service, followed by the barbecue celebration. Uh, our speaker at that service will be Ruth Dalzell, that's my daughter, uh, who is um, the SU schools worker in North Belfast and Newton Abbey. Uh, and then following the Young People's Day, on the Monday to Wednesday of that week, we were, are having our Bible Club for um, the primary school age group. And um, our theme is Kings and Queens. And that will be from Monday to the Wednesday. And then on the Friday evening, there will be a special event for the CY. But you'll be getting details on a little leaflet uh, next Sunday. I think those are all the announcements. Let's worship God together. In the book of Revelation, the very last chapter, we are given a picture of what it's going to be like in paradise, in the new heaven. It said, the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. That's a picture of perfection. We live in an imperfect world. And until that day when there is that perfection given to us, those who trust in the Lord, we are to live in a world for God and to help to bring healing to the nations if we can, to help those who 
are less fortunate than ourselves. And this being our, ser uh, our service today when we're focusing on Christian aid, we're going to be thinking of how we who claim to be Christians can play our part in a world that needs to know God and needs to know the love of God, not just in words, but also in action. Our first song tells us of the reasons why we should worship the Lord. There are more than 10,000 reasons for us to come and to worship him and to thank him for all his goodness. So let's stand as we sing 10,000 reasons. Let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we bow before you today. And we've just been singing about all the reasons that we ought to praise you. We thank you for all your goodness to us. We thank you for your great love. We thank you for your mercy. That amazing grace. Father, you created this world through the Lord Jesus Christ. A wonderful world, a beautiful world, a perfect world. A world in which you have given us so much 
You've given us the beauty of nature around us. You've given us the opportunity to live in it. And Lord, it was paradise until our forefathers decided that they knew best. Adam and Eve decided that they wanted to do things their way. And so they ignored your command to trust you and to obey you. And in so doing, they forfeited the pleasure, the blessing of being in that paradise. Lord, we're living in the world as a result of that because there's so much around us that is sinful and that sin causes hurt to others, hurt to ourselves, but most of all it hurts your heart because human beings constantly ignore you, think that they can live without you, complain about you whenever things don't go the way they want and yet you have remained unchanged. Your love still the same. Your mercy is available. Forgiveness is ours when we confess our sins. And through Jesus Christ and what he has done on Calvary means that we can be restored into fellowship with you. Father, we look around us and we see so much need. And yet your love can supply our needs. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who, who comes and reveals truth to us. Opens our eyes to, to see you in nature itself. The one who planned it all. The one who sustains it all. The one who provides for all. And so we worship you, O oh God, through Jesus Christ. Asking that as we continue in worship here today... We will be convicted of our sin. And then by the Holy Spirit opening our eyes to see Jesus as the answer. The ultimate answer to our need. And in response give our lives totally into his hands. So hear us O God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. As we come in worship. And we bring to you our prayers with the thanksgiving for all that you've done and the blessing of forgiveness that is ours through Christ. Hear our prayer, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to allow uh, staff members of Christian Aid to lead us in the Lord's Prayer. Now it's slightly different from the way we say, we say it in the, in the old version. But if you want to share with them and pray with them. The words will be on the screen as they lead us in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. As we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours. Now and forever. Amen. 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 Boys and girls, lovely to see you today, and you're mostly upstairs, not all upstairs. I wonder, have you ever seen someone do this? What are they doing? What are they doing? What's that little girl doing? Yes, a heart. Well done. That was Chloe. Yes, well done. I wonder, could you do that? I'll put another picture up just to let you see how it could be done. Okay, can you, so can you get your 
hands together and put your knuckles just where your, where your uh, nails are. And put them together and then put your thumbs down at the bottom and do it again. Okay? Yeah. How flexible are we? But sometimes in TV you see folk doing this here. And it's talking about love. Love. Whether they're saying it to someone else, we love you. Or it's just a sign for love. In the Bible, there is a verse in the book of James, which is in the New Testament. Uh, And this is what it says. If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. Today we are thinking in our service about other people in the world who need love. Now they've got family probably who love them, but they need us to also love them. And to show that love, not just by saying we love you, even though we don't know where you live, we'll probably never be to where you live. But we want to say we love you and we can do that by praying for them. And we will be doing that later on in our service. But also we can help to send them the things that they need to live. Those who are living in country because of climate change where The soil is so dry that they can hardly grow anything. And yet there are opportunities to help them, sometimes to provide the water that they need so that they can dig wells. But at other times that they can send special seeds that will grow in the ground that's maybe a little bit dry. We can love them by showing our love on not just a day like today whenever we're thinking about Christian aid, and the things that Christian aid do for other people in other countries. But also we should think about them every day. In our first song we were thinking about all the blessings that we have from God. We live in a part of the world where it is very good. And we do complain about the rain, don't we? Because it maybe stops you from going out to play. And, and I know that teachers love it to be a dry day. Or at least dry at break time and lunch time. So that you can get out to play in the fresh air. But we live in a country where we usually have plenty of rain to help the thing. And we do have the sunshine. And we have lots of things that we can enjoy. We are blessed. And we should thank God every day for the blessings that we have. But then we should also think of others and pray for them. And where we can help them. And we can do that by, yes, sending our money to people like Christian Aid. Who will then help others. In other countries. So whenever you see someone doing that, they're saying that is a symbol for love. And they might say, Well, we love you. We should also say to other people, We love them, because the Bible tells us we're supposed to do that. And neighbor just doesn't mean the person who lives next door to us or there's someone down the road. We live in a world where everyone in the world is our neighbor. And so we should love them. It says we are to love God first and foremost. And then to love our neighbours. And that is a royal law they say. Something that we should all be doing. I wonder will you think of that? Will you pray for those boys and girls throughout the world who who need, need that help? And pray for the people like Christian Aid who bring that help. And we want them to know blessing as well. So maybe you'll remember that verse from James chapter 2 and verse 8. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you do that, you're doing the right thing. We're going to sing your song. And after we sing our song, the the young folk in in jam will be going across to the hall. Um, There is no CY today. But the the younger ones can go across to the hall. After we sing, he's got the whole wide world in the hand. Talking about God and his love for the whole world. He 
We're doing things a wee bit different today, so after we have our sermon, we'll have a song, but that's not the end of the service, just in case you, uh, you feel like standing and then walking out. Um, we're going to have our prayers for others at the end of this, of this the service. <clears throat> Whenever you hear the word Christian aid, I, I wonder what comes into your mind. I grew up in a, in, a, in a congregation where we were very much involved uh, in Christian aid. But I don't think I was ever told, when did it start? If I asked you that question, when did Christian aid start? Could you give me a year? Hmm. Now, we've been, we, we have been supporting Christian aid in this congregation for I don't know how long. But I just to help you understand about Christian aid, I'm just going to give you a very, very brief overview <clears throat> of it. it. It was founded in 1945, so it's before some of you were born, most of you. Um, and it was founded by British and Irish churches to, to help refugees after the Second World War. And then in the 1950s, um, they launched Christian Aid Week. And this past week has been Christian Aid Week. Uh, and um, they were helping refugees from mainland Europe, Korea, and Palestine. As you can see, little has changed over the years. Uh, and then it comes into my era in 19, the 1960s. They created the Disasters Emergency Committee. You've heard that, and sometimes it appears on your screens on television. So that development agencies were seen to work together in times of humanitarian crises. And as a child, I, the name Biafra was on the news, uh, and um, you, we saw pictures on our black and white television screens of children in Africa and what was going on there. There were lots of crises in the 60s, but Biafra and Kenya and India were, were just some of them. And also in the 60s, they, they were speaking out against racism. Uh, and as I was reading about this, they, I'm told that Christian aid helped to advise Martin Luther King about standing up against racism. As we move into the 1970s, they were involved in educating folk at home about the root causes of poverty and working with overseas agencies to eradicate it. 
and that is an ongoing problem, isn't it? But they're also explaining the effects of a consumer culture and encouraging simple living. And I don't know if you've been watching television during the week and there was a program about how to save money um, in, as far as food was concerned and they were also saying how much food is wasted. So from the 70s onwards, we still haven't learned the lesson that we do need to live in a simple way and not be in this culture of throwing things away. Uh, all has to be new. That was the 1970s. And then in the 80s, they were responding to the crisis in Ethiopia, Mozambique, again, Africa, in difficulty, lobbying parliament, calling for more developmental aid. I'll not try it again. But also then in South Africa, they uh, actually created the Southern African Coalition demanding an end to apartheid. And we know how long that took until that eventually happened. That was the 80s. And then in the 90s, they linked work uh, in 50 poor countries <clears throat> so that the campaign that they would have would all talk about these various things. And one of the things that was world debt, and we know how many countries got themselves into debt and how they, they were trying to develop ways to help those countries overcome the debt that they had. They wanted to develop fair trade and the policies of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, again, to help these countries who were struggling and Christian aid were campaigning for this help to be given. And then in the, in the noughties, as we call it, they campaigned to make poverty history. And I can remember whenever um, I was in First Bangor at the time, uh, and uh, I remember the Christian aid um, van bus thing came, uh, uh, and we were encouraged to, to write to the government and to sign cards uh, to try and make poverty history. And all the while there was, of course, um, wars and terrorists and all the rest of it happening. And again, unfortunately, they are st those sorts of things are still with us. And also they reached more than 500,000 people with food, shelter and health care after the tsunami that had taken place in Asia. And then from the 2010s, the thing is all about climate change. We're talking to children about that. And uh, later on, we will be seeing a, a little video clip talking about how Christian is helping those come to terms with climate change, but also to help them to grow food in the midst of it all. And then another thing that has been so big on the, the news is the tax justice where some of the big corporations were basically evading tax uh, and uh, they were saying that this isn't right. Uh, some of them were, were uh, in countries where they could have been doing with the, the money raised from tax, but these big countries were trying to evade it by the way they set up their companies. And so Christian Aid was championing tax justice. That's just a little overview of what Christian Aid has been involved right from the early days of the mid-40s right through to now. And so we think of Christian Aid. But I sometimes wonder, do we actually get the wrong impression? Christian Aid. I know that in the past, Christian Aid has maybe got a bit of a bad press because they, they recognize of all the work that they're doing and some say, but it's only a social gospel. They, they, they don't seem to major on the gospel itself. Yes, they are doing wonderful work helping people with food and water and, and debt and things like that, but, but what about the gospel? Well, I want to just, for a moment or two, just think of Christian aid. And the first word is Christian. But what does Christian actually mean? 
If you were to go onto the streets and ask people, what is a Christian? Some will say, oh, well, it's someone who's born in a Christian country. That means that you're a Christian. Opposed to living in a country where it's uh, Muslim, Hindu, or some other religion. So a Christian is someone who's born in a Christian country. And so they say, well, if you were born in, in the United Kingdom, in Ireland, you're a Christian because you were born in that country. But is that what Christian actually means? One of the readings suggested for our service today is Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. Uh, And I'm going to have that read for us now. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the river Jordan. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Amen. As you can see that um, those who were coming out who were Pharisees, that they were claiming that they were people of God because of their heritage. But that wasn't what John was saying to them. So the word Christian, I want to just draw out three phrases from our passage and I'll give you three words to help you remember that. The first one is admonition. Admonition, that means to encourage, to advise, sometimes to rebuke. But we take admonition to be to advise, to encourage. And John the Baptist's message to everyone that he met was this, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Being a Christian is first of all someone who admits that they are a sinner. The message is to repent. We need to repent to become part of the kingdom of God. We cannot just grow into it. We just can't because our forefathers were Christians, then we are automatically Christians. Every person needs to repent That means to turn their back on their old life and to turn to a new life. To say sorry for the sins of our past and to turn to follow in Christ's way. An admonition, that is what John the Baptist was telling the people. You need to repent if you're going to be part of the kingdom of God. To be part of the kingdom of God equals Christian. But then secondly, there is the identification, which I have already alluded to, but it's something that we need to do. People went out to him from the various areas that are mentioned in that passage, confessing their sins, and they were baptized by him. You see, we need to identify 
with this message that we are sinners and we need to repent. What we need to do, we need to confess. Now that's hard to do, isn't it? You think, for example, um, a child who has done something they shouldn't have, and I've seen it often enough in the classroom, and you confront them with the truth. And the hardest thing for them to say is, yes, I did it. They will work their way around it. They will try to wriggle out of it. And they'll do anything but actually confess. And that is what happens to us. Yes, the Bible says that we're all sinners. And we need to repent. But to actually confess that we are sinners and we actually identify where we have rebelled against God, then we're not going to be forgiven. Because until we identify with the sin that is within us and say we are, then we cannot be forgiven. And the identification with sin and the need to be cleansed was their willingness to be baptized. A symbol of cleansing. So identification. But then that was the beginning of the life. But there then has to be a demonstration. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Now what does that mean? Well, in the first place, it, our lives should show the difference that we actually have confessed our sins, we have repented, we are now children of God, and so we produce fruit in keeping, which means we live a life that demonstrates that. Demonstration that Christ lives within us. If that's the case, then not only does he live within us, but he lives through us. And so we then live in such a way that shows that Jesus is our Lord as well as our Savior. We are willing to do what he asks. We are to live a life that shows that we are part of the family of God. As I often say, showing the family likeness. So admonition, identification, and demonstration. But the problem is that so often today there is hypocrisy. We see it in politics. We just have to think of our own country and think of a few weeks ago whenever we had the election. And as I said recently, the promise of the earth, and they're going to do this and they're going to do that. And they claim to be and then in reality, there's something different. That is what hypocrisy is. It's like wearing a mask. We see it in society itself. Oh, they, have, they claim to have high morals and, and they claim to be this and that. And they're so tolerant and all the rest of it. And then what do they do? Well, they're the most intolerant. Very often those who claim to be tolerant are the most intolerant because they will not accept other people's point of view. But sadly, it's also seen in the church. And this is where the world looks at us and says, but you claim to be. You claim to be Christians, which means little Christs, Christ-like but we don't see it. And this is where we do come into the whole area of Christian aid. Because you see, we claim to be Christians, but are we actually showing the likeness? Are we like Christ? And we read in scripture that Christ had compassion for the people he looked over Jerusalem and he wept. He saw them like sheep without a shepherd. They were in great need. 
But what did Jesus do? He reached out with compassion. He did something about it. Those who were hurting. Those who were experiencing anxiety. Those who were sorrowing. He did something about it. And so if we claim to be Christians, then we need to be doing something, even though it may be something little. We should be doing something that is going to help the situation. So the Christian aid, the aid part of it, what does that involve? Well, again, I'm going to use three words and I'm going to take the word aid, A-I-D, to help you remember. And it's based on three scripture passages. Starting with the one that we've just had read for us. It's application. Application of that verse produce fruit in keeping with repentance. If we claim to be Christians, then we need to apply that verse to our lives. Asking ourselves, are we actually producing fruit in keeping with repentance? Do people look at us and say, well, you claim to be a Christian and you know something, you're showing it. We can hear it. You're demonstrating it. But are we producing fruit in keeping with it? Because we need to apply that. Because there's no point in just claiming it. We need to apply it to our everyday lives. It should be something that comes Christian naturally. <laughs> Application. The second thing is implementation. Implementation of this verse from Micah chapter 6 verse 8. To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And note it's with your God. Walking with God. If we are walking with God day and daily then we will act justly. And we will love mercy. Two sides of a coin. We will want to make sure not only that justice is done for us, but justice is also done for others. As we look across a world in great need and where there is great injustice, we not only should be acting justly, but we should be basically calling for others to act justly. And to love mercy. In other words, we want to be merciful. Some of these people can never repay us. So what? As Christians, I would go as far as to say it's our duty to show mercy. And yes, to pay. It tells us in scripture that we should give without expecting anything in return we live in a world where you invest and you expect a good return if the shares aren't doing too good you get rid of them and get others that are going to give you a better yield scripture says that we are to give without expecting in return that is true christian at christianity to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Implementation of that verse can be costly, but it's demanded. The last word is declaration. If we act in such a way, we implement and we apply, then we will be declaring to those around us, Let us love one another, for love comes from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. That is what we are declaring. When we as believers show that we are believers. That we are willing to obey the master. Where we take on board the story of the good Samaritan. We take on board... What Paul tells us to look out for one another. 
Let us love one another, for love comes from God. If we claim to be believers, if we claim to be Christians, then the love of God dwells within us. But have we got the sluice gates up and not allowing that love to flow to others? Stopping the flow. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Do people see that? That we have been born again. We are born of God and they can see it. They can hear it. And they believe it. Christian aid. What's that for you? Well, I want to ask you two questions. Very, very simply. First of all, are you a Christian? That's fundamental. Are you a believer? Have you come to God? Have you given your life to God? Have you confessed your sin and received that forgiveness? And are you a Christian in that you are Christ-like? In your everyday living? And then when it comes to aid, are you willing to give that aid? To support that aid that every Christian should be involved in? Because that is what we're called to be. First of all, Christians, to love the Lord. And then to love one another. To love our neighbors as ourselves. God loves this world that he made. And he calls his followers to love it. To care for it. To do all in our power to help those who live within it. So that in so doing, we show the love of God and they will then want to come to know that God of love. Someone once said, people cannot hear the gospel if, they are, if their stomachs are making a greater noise. The gospel needs to be proclaimed. But the gospel goes out in two ways. It goes out in word and it goes out in action. We need to be doing both. It's not one or the other. But we need to be able to show that. We're going to sing uh, a song. And it's talking about the world in the state that it's in. It's beauty for brokenness. And it's talking about God of the poor. God wants us to respond. So let's think of the words as we sing Beauty for Brokenness.
just before Christine uh, leads us in our prayers for us, we're going to see a short um, video clip. Madame <laughs> Zamoya <laughs> Sinita <laughs> Chengeta, kana wachingu wawona rujiso waka kwana. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for bringing us together for our Christian aid service today. While we have so much to be thankful for, we need that many more are suffering here and around the world. Please draw close to the hungry, the destitute, the lonely, and those in extreme difficulties through displacement, war, or illness. May the world leaders turn to you for strength courage and wisdom, along with your people reaching out in Christian love and faith. During this time of worship, may we reflect on your abundant blessings in our lives. May we remember those around us who are struggling through various conflicts in their lives. Help us to listen for your instruction on how to show your love in whatever way you want us to. Lord, Thank you for our freedom to meet together in your house. Please strengthen your people for whom this is not possible. Thank you for our leadership here in Kilmore. May they diligently seek your direction on how to spread your word and reach out to the wider community. We ask all these things in and through your precious name. Amen. want to thank um, some folk. Um, Marilyn, every year, 
um, is responsible for getting all the information to you, uh, and I uh, want to thank her for, for all her organisation in, in that. Um, she was to be doing the reading this morning, but uh, the voice just wasn't up to it, so um, thank Mary for stepping in at the last minute. And then want to thank Christine for leading us in our prayers for others. Um, there are, if you haven't already given them, would like to, there are some envelopes still in the, in the vestibule. Or as you uh, saw on the screen, you can give directly through uh, Christian Aid website. And the leaflets uh, with all that information are also available. As we come to bring our service to a close, we're going to sing another hymn that talks about God's concern for the world. It's called I the Lord of Sea and Sky. Let's stand to sing. John, whenever he was writing his letters to the church, said this. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God, to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. We need to go and show that love of God to a world around us. We need his grace. To do so, so let's bless one another 
with the words of the grace as we say, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.